Uh, Itzhak, it's, uh, I think we can uh, start. Shall we? Okay, so um, good afternoon or morning, everyone. Um, to those of you who don't know me, I'm Itzhak Khen. I'm the director of the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies. And each year the Institute hosts uh, uh, six advanced schools in uh, uh, theoretical physics, in life sciences, in mathematics, in computer science, in the humanities, and uh, the most precious one in uh, economic theory. Um, unfortunately, this year, um, some of the advanced schools had to be uh, postponed because of the spread of uh, COVID-19. But luckily, uh, Professor Eric Maskin, a dear friend and supporter of the Institute, um, had decided to uh, not to cancel the advanced school altogether, but to uh, uh, give two lectures on voting theory that will introduce the topic of next year's school, um, which we all hope will take place in the renovated building of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem. Um, and I think it is only fitting that Professor Muskin shall talk about voting theory amidst the pandemic that interrupted our lives in the past four months or so, since the introducing introduction of uh, voting into our, our modern political system was, among others, the result of another pandemic, the Black Death of the 14th century, after which the old feudal political order collapsed and gradually gave way to what seems like a precursor of the modern parliamentary system of government. So uh, without much ado, I shall thank Professor Muskin again for giving the, the uh, uh, lectures and for supporting the Institute uh, um, for many, many years. And I shall pass the baton to uh, Professor Elhanan ben Porat, who will introduce Professor Maskin and the topics. So please, Elhanan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Itzik. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor <laughs> to introduce uh, Eric Maskin, who is a dear friend of many of us. And, um, Eric is an Adams professor uh, of university and professor of economics and mathematics in Harvard University. As I'm sure you all know, uh, Eric was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2007 uh, with Leonid Kurz and Roger Myerson for having, for having laid the foundation for mechanism design. And I think it's fair to say, and even more than fair to say, that the pioneering work of uh, Eric Hurwitz uh, and Meyerson, the area of uh, mechanism design has flourished. It's a major area of research, both in uh, economic theory and in applications. Uh, now, Eric has uh, many important and fundamental contributions in other areas of economic theory including in particular uh, dynamic games, contracting, social choice, and voting, uh, some of which we'll hear about uh, today. Eric has been uh, president of the Game Theory Society, a president of the Economic Society. He is a, a member of the American Academy of Arts and a fellow of the National uh, American Academy, excuse me, of Sciences. Um, now, he is one uh, received, I should say, received uh, many honoraries and prizes, uh, far too numerous to be mentioned here, but I'm happy to say that among, uh, if I counted correctly, 17 honorary doctorates that he has received. One of them is from our Hebrew University, and that's uh, certainly a reason for us to be proud of. Um, now, closer to home, and on a more personal note, Eric has been uh, the director of the school 
in economic theory in the Institute for Advanced Studies in the last 12 years. He is really a true master in designing beautiful programs that combine a theoretical work, which is really the core of the school, with applications and empirical work. The school is a tremendous success, thanks to Eric. It attracts uh, uh, students from all over the world, including the best universities. And it's really a golden opportunity, not just for the young people, but also uh, for uh, old folks like me to hear about the uh, basic results in the area that's being studied as well as the current front line of the research. Uh, so uh, in doing this, Eric, in my view, is making really an invaluable contribution to the education and to the intellectual growth of young generations of research. So uh, Eric, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, to express our deep gratitude to you for taking a, a lead uh, here as well. Um, it's, uh, for me, it's been a, an enormous pleasure and benefit uh, to uh, work with you on this. Um, let me uh, uh, just add, before I give uh, Eric the floor, a comment about the logistics. Um, if you, uh, you have a question, Eric would be happy to address questions. Probably the most effective way to do this is for you to please write your question using the chat mode. And uh, I will be monitoring the, the questions and uh, uh, passing Eric, maybe some of them will be addressed only at the lecture. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so, Eric, thank you very much again, and the floor is yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be in Jerusalem, if only virtually, uh, and to see uh, some of my old friends. Thank you very much, uh, Itzhak and Elchanan, for uh, those lovely introductions. Uh, I was very disappointed that we had to cancel this year's summer school. It, uh, but of course, it was necessary to cancel. This, this will be a, a poor substitute for the intense 10 days that we, that we normally have. But uh, for those of you who may be on this call who haven't participated in a live summer school, I, I, I'm hoping that this may whet your appetite for, for future years. Uh, in any case, uh, what I'd like to talk to what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, is voting, uh, two lectures, and one motivation for uh, for talking about voting is that if you, if we look around the world, the election rules that are used probably in most places. Uh, leave a great deal of room for improvement. And, and if, you, if you need convincing on that point, uh, let me present you with Exhibit A, which is uh, the fact that Donald Trump is president. Uh, we, we might well ask, uh, how could this have happened? Uh, and I imagine that scholars of all sorts will be trying to answer this question for many years to come. I'm going to give a, uh, a very mechanical answer to that question, 
uh, Donald Trump became president of the U.S. because first he was able to get the Republican nomination in 2016. And he did this uh, facing 16 mainstream Republican candidates. So he had a, a lot of opponents, but those opponents ended up canceling each other out. And because Trump was so different from these mainstream Republicans, uh, he was able uh, to emerge as, a, as, the, as the victor. Uh, according to polls early in, in 2016, there were a number of candidates, John Kasich, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, who if they had faced Trump in a one-to-one -one contest, probably would have beaten him. But the point is that they did not face him one-to-one. -one. They faced him all together. And Trump was able to use this old principle of divide and conquer, and he, and he conquered. So the method that the United States uses in its primaries and its, in its general elections is clearly uh, open to criticism. Uh, that leads us to look for better voting rules. And by a voting rule, I just mean some method of deciding on a winning candidate using as inputs voters' preferences, which, which could take the form of rankings or utility functions or simply uh, naming their favorite candidate. And of course, there are many possible voting rules uh, that we could look at. Uh, let me just mention a few examples. One is plurality rule, which is used in Republican primaries in the US. It's used to elect MPs in Britain. It's used to uh, elect members of Congress in, in, in most states in the, in the United States. And in plurality rule, we simply elect the candidates who is ranked first by more voters than any other. We, we only look at voters' top choices. Then there is majority rule, uh, which was pro propounded by the 18th century political thinker and mathematician Condorcet uh, Condorcet uh, suggested that, that voters should rank candidates, and then we would elect the candidate who, according to the rankings, is preferred by a majority to each other candidate. And as you will see in, in my first lecture today, Condorcet, or majority rule, will emerge uh, as the the hero of the story. Uh, then there is uh, runoff voting, uh, which is used to elect presidents in many, in many parts of the world. Uh, France is one example. Russia is one example. Brazil is another example. Uh, in runoff voting, uh, there are two rounds. In the first round, uh, if nobody gets a majority of the votes in the first round, there's a second round in which the two candidates who got the most votes in the first round face each other, and the winner in the second round uh, is, the, is the overall winner. Then there is rank order voting, uh, also called the board account, also called board as rule. Uh, and in the board account, uh, there are N candidates. And when voters make rankings, the candidate will get N points. Sorry, can you, whoever runs the seminar, can you mute everybody? Because we can't hear Eric. Am, 
Okay. Is this better? Uh, yes, Eric, it's better. Okay, good. So, so I was just describing uh, the board accounts. In the board account, uh, voters send in their rankings. Each voter sends in a ranking. And if there are N candidates, a candidate gets N points every time she's ranked first. N minus one points every time she's ranked second and so on. And then we just add up the points and whoever has the most points is the winner. And as you will see, uh, as you will see in my second lecture today, uh, Borda's rule will be the, uh, will be the hero. Now, uh, all of the voting rules I've mentioned so far are ordinal in the sense that the only information that voters are providing uh, is in the form of a, of a ranking. Uh, no cardinal information is being provided. Let me mention uh, two uh, reasonably commonly used cardinal methods. Uh, one is what's called approval voting. Uh, in approval voting, uh, a voter is allowed to uh, approve as many of the candidates running as, as he wants to. And the reason that this is uh, a cardinal rule is that you cannot tell just from a voter's ranking where the cutoff between approved candidates and unapproved candidates is going to be. That, that presumably depends on some uh, cardinal criterion that the, that the voter has. And the winner of the election is just the candidate who is approved by the most voters. And then finally, let me mention uh, a method called majority judgment. This uh, has been propounded particularly by Michelle Belinsky and Rita Larrake, um, and it's also cardinal. The idea is that uh, a voter will give a grade to a candidate, say on a 10-point scale. So 10 would be superb and one would be terrible. And then we elect the candidate who has the highest median grade. Uh, alternatively, we could look at the highest mean grade, but uh, for theoretical reasons, Larrake and Belinsky argue for the highest median grade. Well, I could, I could spend the, the whole day talking about other voting methods. I won't do that. Uh, rather, I want to uh, ask the question, well, out of all of these many voting rules that we could use, uh, which one should we use? And the way that uh, a voting theorist like me tries to answer that question is to first step back and ask, well, what is it that we actually want in a voting rule? What are, what are some good principles or criteria or axioms that a good voting rule uh, should satisfy? Uh, and that's actually how a lot of the voting theory literature has proceeded axiomatically. And that's how I'm going to proceed uh, today. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give you more than a taste of this field. I'll, I'll talk about uh, two of my own papers. Uh, in the, as, um, as, as Yitzhak said, I, I'm expecting that there will be a, a full summer school on voting uh, sometime in the next few years. It'll, it'll be more than just axiomatic voting. It, there will be plenty of other aspects, including the interaction between voting and the economy that will be discussed. Uh, but, but we will discuss axiomatic voting as well. Um, today, uh, I want to concentrate on uh, two uh, quite recent uh, contributions, which I think 
shed some, some new light on uh, two very famous results in voting theory, uh, results which I imagine most of you uh, know something about. One is the uh, Arrow Impossibility Theorem. Uh, and this is probably the single most, find, most famous finding in, um, in voting theory. You'll see in my second lecture that I'll, in a sense, be uh, re-examining this theorem. Uh, but in the first lecture, I want to concentrate on the gibbard satterthwaite theorem, which is uh, uh, also uh, an important result in this area. OK, well, that, that's, my, uh, that's my introduction. Let me, let me dive right into the, into the first lecture. And if you want to see the paper that this lecture is based on, um, I, I've got the title up on the screen. It, it will be coming out in the American Economic Review uh, Insights uh, uh, pretty soon. I think, I think it's actually already up there in uh, electronic form, and you can also find it um, on my website. So I said that, that in voting theory, we proceed axiomatically. One, one important axiom that I'm going to be discussing in this lecture is, is strategy proofness, which is simply the idea that if we're holding an election, voters should not have the incentive to misrepresent their preferences or to vote strategically. They should vote according to what they truly feel. And, and there, are, there are at least two good reasons why strategy proofness is, is valuable. Uh, one, uh, one pretty obvious reason is that if, if voters are voting strategically, then we're not really implementing the voting rule that we thought we were. Because if we're distorting the inputs into the voting rule, the preferences that voters are providing, then we're also, of course, distorting the output. And so even if, the, even if we thought the voting rule was uh, satisfying some, some nice properties, uh, if the inputs are being distorted, perhaps the outputs will not satisfy the, the properties that we had hoped for. Uh, but perhaps an even more important reason why uh, strategy proofness is, uh, is valuable is that without it, things are much more difficult for voters. Uh, uh, think of it this way. If, if you're a conscientious citizen, it's hard enough for you to figure out what your own preferences are. You, you have to invest a fair amount of time and energy in reading up on the candidates and watching them in debates and uh, finding out what their positions on all the issues are. That, that, that's that's a, a real investment. If on top of that, you have to figure out how other people are going to vote so that you can vote strategically to counteract what they're doing, that's, that's what strategic voting entails. Well, then your decision problem is at least several orders of magnitude more difficult. Uh, let me give you uh, a little example, again, from the 2016 uh, Republican primaries. Uh, I, I mentioned three of the candidates, Donald Trump, Marco Rubio, and John Kasich. Uh, let's imagine that Republican voters uh, fell into three categories, the Trump voters, the Rubio voters, the Kasich voters. Uh, this, this is a, a somewhat stylized example, but I think represents uh, some truth uh, about the 2016 election. Uh, now, if we use plurality rule, then you can see Trump wins because he has 40% uh, of the vote. That's more than Rubio or Kasich gets. But Kasich is actually preferred by a majority to Trump. These people prefer Kasich to, to Trump, and these people prefer Kasich to Trump. And uh, 
if the Rubio voters realize that under plurality rule, which is what they used, uh, Trump is going to win, they might try voting for Kasich. And if they, if they do all vote for Kasich, then Kasich wins. But um, to get Rubio voters to vote for Kasich requires a fair amount of information on the part of the Rubio voters. They have to know that this is what the situation looks like and that if they don't vote for Kasich, Trump is going to win. So uh, that's, uh, that kind of coordination and sophistication was actually tried in the, in the 2016 Republican primaries. It didn't work. Uh, Rubio voters said, yes, I, I prefer Kasich to Trump, but most of them did not end up voting for, for Kasich. They ended up sticking with Rubio. So uh, all of this is to say that we want to avoid voting rules like plurality rule in which voters like these Rubio voters have to make complicated calculations in order to get the candidates they really want to win. Unfortunately, when it comes to strategy proofness, we have a basic negative result, and that's the Gibbard Satterthwaite theorem, which says that if there are three or more candidates running, uh, there's no candidates, there's no voting rule that is always strategy proof, except for uh, dictatorial voting rules where one voter has all the power. Uh, but there's a sense in which Gibbard Satterthwaite is too pessimistic. It's overly pessimistic because uh, Gibbard Satterthwaite say that to qualify as being strategy proof, a voting rule must always be strategy proof. That is, it, regardless of what preferences voters end up having. And in practice, some preferences uh, could occur, but are actually quite unlikely to occur. And so maybe we shouldn't worry so much uh, about, about those preferences. So um, I want to ask a natural follow-up question. Well, given that we can't get a voting rule, which is always strategy proof, which reasonable voting rules are strategy proof when strategy proofness is possible? That, that, that's, what this, that's what this lecture is about, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, provide an answer. Uh, and uh, since this is not a, a mystery show, uh, I don't mind telling you the, uh, the answer uh, in advance. It's going to be majority rule. Majority rule uh, is the reasonable voting rule, which is strategy proof, when strategy proofness is possible. And I, and I will make that, all of those terms uh, precise. So uh, in order to get to that question and answer, let me uh, first provide a model for you. There's a, uh, <clears throat> we'll start with a set of candidates, a finite set of candidates. Uh, one aspect of this model, which is not completely standard, is that rather than looking at a finite number of voters, I'm actually going to look at a continuum. And the reason for looking at a continuum uh, will become clear in a few minutes. So a typical voter is, uh, is a point in, in, say, the unit interval from zero to one. Uh, and each voter can be described uh, by her utility function. So a utility function assigns a utility to each candidate and higher numbers correspond to better candidates from that voter's point of view. I'm going to uh, insist both in this lecture and the, the next one on uh, 
strict utility function. So I'm going to rule out uh, indifference. Uh, if you've ever worked on voting theory, uh, you know that indifference creates uh, real analytic headaches. It's not terribly enlightening. And so rather than uh, uh, worry about indifference, I'm just going to rule it out. Uh, and let's, I'm going to use uh, curly U's to correspond to domains or sets of utility functions. Curly U, X is the set of all strict utility functions. And now we can describe our electorates, our society, by a profile. A profile is just, which I, and I'll use the notation U dot for profile. It's just a specification of every utility, every individual's uh, utility function. A voting rule takes a profile and a subset of candidates Y to an outcome. Now, uh, this subset Y you should think of as the, as the ballot. So, so Capital X is the set of all conceivable candidates, but not all of those candidates will actually run. Some, some candidates will run, and that, that's the set in, in Y, the ballots. So a voting rule takes a profile of utility functions and a ballot to an outcome, which is uh, a randomization over, uh, over Y. So, so in this formulation, we're allowing for the outcome to be random. Uh, in other words, the winner might be determined at least partly by chance. Uh, of course, in actual elections, we rarely use chance. Uh, we, 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 usually want a voting rule which is decisive in the sense that there is a unique non-random winner. Uh, but this isn't, this isn't always possible because it may turn out, say if we're using plurality rule, that there are two candidates who are both, who both get the same number of votes and, the, and they're, they're both ranked first uh, the most, in which case we don't have a deterministic winner. We have to, we have to use a randomizing device. Uh, this could happen with, with any of the other voting rules I, I mentioned as well. It could happen with uh, the board accounts. Uh, the point is, though, that having an exact tie like this is not very likely if there are a lot of Voters. The more voters there are, the less likely it is to have an exact tie. And that's, that's the reason for working, or that's one of the reasons for working with the continuum, the idea that ties are non-generic. Uh, they, they occur with probability zero. So, uh, so one axiom, uh, decisiveness, is that our voting rule uh, should produce a non-stochastic winner for a generic profile of preferences. Now, of course, once we're using a continuum, we can't literally count the number of voters who, say, prefer candidate X to candidate Y. We're going to work um, with proportions instead, or it, to use the, the measure theoretic term, we're going to work with Lebesgue measure. So, so we'll look, look at the fraction of voters or the proportion of voters who prefer X to Y. And now um, I've completely specified the model. I can define all of the voting rules that I talked about in my introductory remarks uh, formally. So, so here is the, the formal definition of plurality rule. Uh, what does this say? Well, 
this, this set in curly brackets here is the set of candidates X uh, Uh, well, all right, so, so th this set here is the set of uh, uh, candidates, of, of, of voters who prefer X to any other Y. So, so, so these are the voters who rank X first. And, and for X to be a plurality winner, it has to be the case that the, the proportion of voters who put X first is higher than the proportion of voters who put X prime first, some other candidate first. So, so these X's here are the potential plurality winners. Now there could be more than one of them, remember? There could be an exact tie, and in that case, uh, we resolve the tie by a randomization. So that's what Q is. Uh, Eric, Eric. It, yes. Eric, there's a question. Uh, well, what is a generic profile? A generic profile is uh, a pro... So we, ha we have the set of all possible profiles that uh, voter, voters uh, utility functions lie in a big set. We, we choose a profile at random. Uh, a generic profile is uh, uh, a, uh, a profile that occurs with um, Let me put it slightly differently. The, 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 the cases where we have taught, if, if we choose a, a, uh, a profile at random, the, the chance that we're going to have a tie is zero if we're, if we're working with a continuum of voters. Uh, a generic profile is any profile except the ones where we have tie. Okay. So, so coming back to plurality rule, uh, the reason this looks a little bit complicated and, and the reason why we have to have this Q here is that there could be a tie. It, it, it's non-generic. It happens with probability zero, but it could happen. And then, and then we randomize to, uh, to determine the winner. Uh, and I can, I can uh, define the other voting rules that I mentioned uh, in similar ways. I'm, I'm not going to go into that now. Now, what other axioms uh, should, a, should a good voting rule, a reasonable voting rule, satisfy? I'm going to go through uh, a few axioms which uh, are actually all completely standard from the, from the voting literature. Uh, one of them uh, is called the Pareto Principle, or you might call it the, the Consensus Principle. It says that if everybody, if all voters prefer X to Y, and if X is actually on the ballot, then we shouldn't elect Y. It would be very perverse to elect Y if literally everybody prefers X. Uh, another pretty obvious property uh, is what uh, voting theorists call anonymity. Uh, you, another name for this axiom is uh, uh, one person, one vote, or equal treatment of voters. Uh, anonymity says that if we have a profile and then we uh, permute the 
voters. So we, we give voter I's preferences to voter J, and we give voter J's preferences to voter K, and so on. So we permute the preferences, but the distribution uh, remains the same. Well, then uh, the outcome should be the same. Uh, th th this says that who has the preferences doesn't matter. It's just the preferences themselves that matter. That, that's the anonymity principle. Uh, and just as we insist through anonymity that all voters be treated symmetrically, uh, the next axiom, which is called neutrality, says that all candidates should be treated symmetrically. So suppose that we, um, suppose that we permute the candidates. So candidate X becomes candidate Y, and candidate Y becomes candidate Z. And suppose that we, uh, that, that we permute uh, candidates in the same way in voters' preferences. So wherever X was in voter I's ranking now, now we put uh, uh, candidate Y and, and so on. Well then, if, if X won the election before the permutation, well now, Y should win the election because X has now been replaced by Y. That's, that's neutrality, which just says equal treatment for candidates. Now, uh, not surprisingly, all of the voting rules that I talked about in the introduction satisfy the Pareto principle, anonymity, and neutrality, because these are all so, such obvious uh, axioms that it's, it's hard to imagine uh, using anything in practice which violates one of these axioms. Uh, that's not true for, for the next axiom, and partly for that reason, uh, this next axiom has been um, the most controversial. Uh, still, I'm going to argue that it has a, uh, it has quite a compelling justification, quite an attractive justification. And furthermore, it has a very good pedigree because uh, in different forms, it was proposed more or less at the same time by uh, two uh, major figures in our field, Kenneth Arrow and John Nash. Now, uh, in this, in this lecture, I'm going to use the Nash formulation, and in lecture two, where I'm going to be talking about the Arrow and possibility theorem, I'm going to use the Arrow formulation. Uh, so this axiom is uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives, or since our alternatives are candidates in elections, you, you, you might think of it as IIC rather than IIA. Uh, and this is the Nash formulation. So let's suppose we run an election and X is the winner. Uh, but suppose that we discover after the election was run that, in fact, not all of the candidates who were on the ballots were, uh, were legal. Uh, some, some of them should not have been appearing on the ballot. So we, we, we run the election again without those uh, illegal candidates, none of, none of whom won, by the way. X, X was the winner. Uh, well, according to IIA, uh, X should still win. That is, if you delete some non-winning candidates, uh, that should not change uh, who the winner is. Now, one reason why, why this is an attractive property is that it rules out uh, vote splitting. And, and to see that, let's go back uh, to the example I was looking at before. If, 
In this uh, Trump Rubio Kasich example, uh, we saw that with plurality rule, uh, Trump wins. But uh, that's only because Rubio is taking votes away from Kasich. Ru Rubio is splitting off votes from Kasich's support. If, if Rubio dropped out so that it was a head-to-head -head contest between Kasich and Trump, Kasich would win because these people prefer Kasich to Trump and these people prefer uh, Kasich to Trump and that's 60%. So plurality rule uh, clearly Plurality rule clearly violates uh, independence of irrelevant candidates. If, if, if we delete Rubio, uh, now Kasich wins rather than Trump. Uh, and that can be viewed as, as, as a good thing because uh, indeed Kasich is more popular than Trump. More people prefer more people rank him above Trump. Uh, and majority rule, unlike plurality rule, um, satisfies IIA uh, because if X is the majority winner, that means a majority prefers X to Y and a majority prefers X to Z and so on. If some of those non-winning candidates drop out, well, X still prefers the remaining candidates by a majority, and so it satisfies IIA. Uh, it's easy to see that IIA is also satisfied by approval voting and majority judgments. Um, but some of the uh, some of the uh, other voting rules I mentioned, in particular plurality rule, board accounts, runoff voting, all violate, all violate IIA. Uh, I already showed you uh, why plurality rule violates uh, IIA. Uh, here's an example uh, illustrating that the board account uh, violate, <coughs> violates IIA. Uh, there are two groups of voters. Uh, the 55% the group have the ranking XYZ. The 45% group have the ranking YZX. If you calculate the, uh, the border winner for this example, it turns out to be Y. Uh, even though Y is ranked first by a minority. And the reason Y wins is because these people, although they don't rank Y first, rank Y second. So, so in a three-way race, Y is the winner. Uh, however, if candidate Z drops out, then it's a two-person race between X and Y, and then X wins. So, so board account violates um, IIA. Uh, you can also uh, go back to my previous uh, Trump Kasich Rubio example and see that uh, that that uh, in a runoff vote uh, we would have an IIA violation as well. So that's that's IIA. Uh, I have one axiom to go, and that's actually the one that I started with um, in my introductory remarks. Uh, that's uh, strategy proofness. Uh, in fact, we're going to look not just at individual strategy proofness, but strategy proofness for for groups, for, for coalitions. And we'll we'll say that a uh, we'll say that a uh, voting rule is strategy proof if there's no coalition who could change the outcome from X to X prime and uh, 
and everybody in that coalition gains from that manipulation. Or to put it slightly differently, if a coalition succeeds in changing the outcome from X to X prime, then it has to be the case that somebody in the coalition does not gain from the manipulation. And that's, that's, the, that's the notion of strategy proofness that we'll be talking about. Well, I think I'll, I'll skip the randomization part. Eric? Yes. There's a question coming in about right. uh, voting. What do you exactly mean, given that uh, we have just your utilities? The, you, the, of the of the voters, what do you mean exactly by how how from can you did you do you apply voting? I I didn't catch the last uh, the last part of the question. How do you apply what approval voting or approval the, voting? Yeah. Okay. So so think of it this way. Uh, uh, you have a utility function. You also have a, uh, a utility level, which you, uh, you think of as the minimum quality. Okay. For which a, uh, for, for which a, uh, which a candidate has to attain in order to be uh, approved by you. Uh, I see. And that, that's what approval voting is, uh, and that's why it's a cardinal concept, because that minimum utility level cannot be deduced just looking at that voter's ranking. You need more information than just ordinal. Okay, very good. However, if we're imposing strategy proofness, and decisiveness, it's an immediate, almost an immediate result that a voting rule has to be ordinal. That is, we, we cannot look at any cardinal information. Um, and it, it's pretty easy uh, to see uh, why, that's, why that's the case. This, this is the, I've got the formal definition of ordinality up, but uh, it, it should be clear what I mean by that. I, it means that we're only looking at uh, voters' rankings and not on their the utility numbers. Uh, and and this this is the first result, uh, which says that if if a voting rule is decisive and uh, strategy proof, then it has to be uh, ordinal, at least generically, and. To understand this, let, let's look at uh, majority judgment, which is not ordinal. In majority judgment, uh, voters grade candidates on, on a one to 10 scale, say, and then we, the winner is the, the candidate who has the highest median grade. Um, suppose that uh, X and Y are the candidates, and suppose that you're a voter uh, who, um, if you were voting objectively, you would give uh, X an eight and Y a seven. So, so quite, quite good candidates uh, and not a huge difference in their grades. You, you think they're both really quite good. But would you, would you vote this way uh, in the actual election? Uh, well, notice that you, you, you have an incentive to do something very different. Since you like X more than Y, you have an obvious incentive to elevate X's grade, both the max, give X the maximum, uh, and Y uh, a, uh, as low a grade as possible, say a one. Um, why, why do you have this incentive? Because you prefer X to Y. The, 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 this, uh, 
this increases the chance that X will, will beat Y. Uh, and so there's a very obvious uh, violation of strategy proofness with majority judgment. Same thing with approval voting, same thing with any uh, voting rule which is cardinal. So, uh, so majority judgment is not uh, strategy proof and neither is any other cardinal voting rule. So now we've got rid of approval voting and majority judgment. Uh, and with IIA, we got rid of plurality rule and runoff voting and rank order voting. Uh, so out of all of the voting rules I mentioned in the introduction, there's just one left. There's majority rule. Um, unfortunately, majority rule violates our decisiveness axiom. And, and this was a point that uh, Condorcet himself made uh, 200, 250 years ago. Uh, here, here's an example where there are three groups of voters and I've indicated what their, uh, what their preferences are. Uh, notice that uh, uh, the candidate X could not be the majority winner in this example because a majority of people prefer Z. These people prefer Z to X and these people prefer Z to X. But candidate Z can't be the majority winner because there's a majority who prefer Y. These people prefer Y to Z, and these people prefer Y to Z. Uh, but uh, Y can't be the majority winner because a majority prefer X. These people prefer X to Y, and these people prefer X to Y. So there, there is no majority winner. This is the Condorcet paradox. Uh, sadly, if you look at the axioms I've been talking about, there is no voting rule. Even moving outside the six that I was talking about in the introduction, there is no voting rule whatsoever that satisfies all six. Pareto, anonymity, neutrality, IIA, decisiveness, and strategy proofness. And this is, this is essentially the gibbard sabbath weight impossibility theorem. But as I was suggesting, it's an overly pessimistic uh, theorem because there are many cases in which uh, some rankings uh, are not very likely. And, and so I would argue that the next step from Gibbard Satterthwaite is to look at restricted domains of utility functions, where we're not looking at all possible utilities, but a restricted domain of utilities, will say that a, a voting rule works well for a restricted domain if it satisfies the, the six axioms when voters' preferences, their rankings are drawn from that, from that domain. And in particular, majority rule will work well as long as there are no Condorcet cycles. Now, a, a Condorcet cycle is a situation like this, where, uh, where the preferences themselves cycle. We have X, Y, Z, Y, Z, X, Z, X, Y as long as we don't have three preference orderings with that cyclical uh, pattern, then uh, then majority rule works well. Uh, and there are some natural conditions uh, in which Condorcet cycles can be ruled out. Uh, for example, if voters' preferences are single peaked, uh, we cannot have Condorcet cycles. Single peaked in a political 
uh, setting means that uh, voters vote um, ideologically. You could imagine candidates uh, ranging from uh, the far left to the far right. Uh, each voter is somewhere on that ideological spectrum. And if voters vote according to how close candidates are to the voter uh, on the ideological spectrum, preferences will be single peaks. Um, another example that, another condition that rules out uh, Condorcet cycles is when there is some candidate uh, who is, who people feel strongly about. If, if Trump, Rubio, and Kasich are running, um, people may not feel so strongly about Kasich and Rubio, but everybody feels strongly about Trump. They either love him or they hate him. Uh, they either rank him first or last. Uh, as long as there's a strongly felt candidate like Donald Trump, again, we cannot have a Condorcet cycle. So uh, let, me, let me show you why uh, this result is true, why majority rule works well uh, if there are no Condorcet cycles. I, uh, I'm not going to show you uh, that majority rule is decisive in that case because that's that's an old result, uh, uh, and I'll refer you to the literature going back to the to the 60s uh, on um, on that. Uh, but uh, what I do want to show you is that if we can rule out Condorcet cycles, then majority rule. Uh, is strategy proof. And, and to see why, uh, let's suppose that when voters send in their true preferences, their true utility functions, uh, X is the winner, the Congress say winner. Uh, suppose that there's some coalition C uh, who, if they uh, manipulate their preferences if they if they send in uh, u prime rather than u, uh, then they get a, a a different outcome. They produce a different outcome. Why? Uh, and suppose that everybody in the coalition uh, benefits from that manipulation. They everybody in the coalition prefers y to x. Well, remember we were assuming that X was a Condorcet winner for the true preferences when, 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 when voters vote truthfully. So that tells us that this coalition, which has produced Y, which prefers Y, must actually be in the minority by definition of a Condorcet winner. But that means because they're in the minority that they can't change the outcome from X to Y. And therefore, there can be no such manipulation which, um, which is profitable. And, and, and we've proved that majority rule is indeed uh, strategy proof when we can rule out Condorcet cycles. Now, in this argument that I just gave, I was implicitly assuming that when a coalition deviated, it was deviating only within the restricted domain of preferences. Otherwise, there wasn't even a guarantee that, um, that there would be a majority winner when they, when they manipulate it. Uh, now, there's some cases where we can ensure 
that coalitions can deviate only within the restrictive domain. Here, here is one such example. Uh, let's suppose that instead of electing candidates, uh, we were interested in choosing uh, a level of a public good. So, so we're in a, a two good economy. There's one public good, there's one private good. Uh, and uh, citizens' preferences for these two goods uh, have the usual properties. They're uh, increasing and they're convex. Uh, and now think of a candidate X as being uh, as corresponding to a level of the public good, P, uh, and a tax which is going to be charged for each, to each citizen uh, to finance that level. Uh, suppose, suppose that the public good, uh, the, the cost of uh, financing the public good is, is linear and, and the marginal cost is C, so we'll charge each uh, citizen CP uh, for, for a level public good. Well, it's not hard to, to check that people's preferences over different levels of the public good are, are single peaks. Uh, so what we could do in order to determine what the level of public good should be is to is to run a, uh, the following mechanism. Uh, each citizen could uh, choose her preferred level of the public good. So citizen I chooses level PI, and then we implement the median level that is uh, proposed. Uh, and each citizen pays a tax according to the implemented level of the public good. Uh, well, uh, because citizens' preferences are single peaked, you can, you can uh, easily see that uh, what a citizen should do is to propose her, her favorites level of the public good and that will mean that the median level is the majority winner, the Condorcet winner. Uh, so here is an example um, of where we're constraining, we're constraining voters to vote within a limited class of preferences. They can only vote for peak, so, so implicitly, they can't go outside the set of, of single peaked uh, preferences. But this, uh, of course, relies on the mechanism designer or the government knowing that, pref that citizens' preferences are restricted uh, in this single peak way. Uh, if, if this restriction is not known in advance, then, as I was suggesting, people could deviate outside the restricted set and produce a, uh, a non-Condorcet winner. Uh, that, that is, there, there, there could be an example where there's no Condorcet winner. And, and so we have to extend uh, majority rule uh, to cover this possibility. Well, to do this, uh, let's examine what is called the Smith set. If there's no Condorcet winner, we can look at the smallest subset of candidates such that uh, for uh, every candidate outside the set, every candidate in the set prefers that outsider by majority. 
So, so if there's a Condorcet winner, the Smith set will be uh, just that, just that Condorcet winner. But if there is no Condorcet winner, then we're just saying that everything in the set beats everything out of the set, outside the set, uh, by a majority. Uh, you can show uh, that the Smith set uh, uh, always exists and is, uh, is, is unique. Uh, so here's how we're going to extend majority rule. If there is a Condorcet winner, that's what we'll choose. If there's not a Condorcet winner, we'll just randomize um, over the Smith set with equal probabilities. This, this voting rule was actually proposed by uh, Peter Fishburn uh, back in the 70s. And now we can show that, uh, that our voting rule, extended majority rule, uh, works well uh, on a domain script U, as long as that domain doesn't contain Condorcet cycles, and even if uh, voters are allowed to distort their preferences outside the restricted domain. Uh, and the argument is, is, is quite similar to the one that I just showed you uh, when voters cannot, uh, cannot distort outside the restricted domain. Uh, the, the, the one, uh, here, here is the one twist. So suppose that, so, so if, if voters are voting honestly, then because their preferences are restricted, we know that there will be a Condorcet winner. If some coalition distorts, uh, then either it produces a Condorcet winner from that distortion, in which case the argument is the same as in the, the, the previous theorem, or uh, you get one of these uh, uh, Smith sets uh, where there are multiple candidates at, that we're randomizing over. Now suppose that the suppose that the true majority winner X is in uh, that uh, is in that Smith set. Then it must be the case that for the distorted preferences, uh, there there's there's some candidates uh, X K that. Uh, a majority prefer to X. If that were not true, then X itself would be a Condorcet winner for the distorted preferences. Now, because we're assuming that this coalition, this coalition which is doing the manipulating, gains from that manipulation, uh, the manipulated outcome, XK, is preferred to X for everybody in the coalition. Uh, but that means that the coalition uh, is greater than half the electorate which again contradicts the fact that X is a Condorcet winner. So we run into exactly the same contradiction we did in the, in the previous theorem. Uh, yes, a coalition might be able to get a different outcome by manipulating, but it can't be the case that it gains from that manipulation, or it can't be the case that everyone in the coalition gains from that manipulation. 
Okay, so uh, we've shown that there are some circumstances where majority rule works well in the sense that it satisfies the six axioms on a restricted domain of preferences. But uh, why stop with majority rule? Why not ask, well, is there some other voting rule that might work well in a limited class of cases, that is for a restricted domain? And, and now we come to uh, what I would regard as the, as the main result of this paper, which is that the answer is no. Uh, if a voting rule works well, uh, it satisfies the six axioms on some domain, then it must be majority rule. There is no other voting rule which can satisfy the six axioms on any domain. Uh, and uh, one thing I like about this result is that it has an extremely simple proof. So simple that I can, I can give you the, essentially the full proof uh, on, uh, on two slides. And here it is. Let, let's, let's, um, First, observe that because we're imposing strategy proof, this, our, if a voting rule satisfies the six axioms, it's going to have to be ordinal. So we, we can't use any cardinal information. Let's first suppose that the, uh, that the uh, number of candidates on the ballot is only two. There, so there are just two candidates. And suppose that we have uh, a situation in which a majority of people rank X above Y. So A here is bigger than a half, but instead of electing the uh, majority candidate, we elect Y. Suppose that could happen. Well then, from neutrality, we can uh, permute X and Y. That is, where, where X was before, we now put Y. And, and where Y was before, we now put X. So, so uh, if for this profile, Y is the winner, then for the permuted profile, X must be the winner. But notice that, the, that these people here who prefer Y to X could, by distorting their votes, by voting for X rather than Y, could reproduce this profile here. So if, if, if some of these uh, Y is preferred to X voters vote for X over Y, they can get Y. And so uh, this voting rule cannot be strategy proof because here is, an, here is a case where uh, some coalition gains by distorting its preferences. And we conclude that for the case of two candidates, the only voting rule that can satisfy the six axioms is majority rule. Now let's extend this to more than two candidates. And Let's suppose that we had a situation uh, as depicted here in which, again, a majority prefer X to Y. There are other candidates too. Uh, a majority prefer X to Y, uh, but Y is elected. 
Well, this is where IIA comes in. If Y is elected here, then if we throw out all other candidates, except for X and Y, then Y will still be elected. But we already saw that in a two candidate setting, F has to be majority rule. So it cannot be the case that if a majority prefers X to Y, Y is elected. And that's all there is to the argument. That is the proof that uh, majority rule is not, not only works well in some circumstances, but it is the only voting rule that can ever work well in the sense of satisfying the six axioms. Now, uh, one way you can think of this result is as a generalization of a, of a famous uh, theorem by Kenneth May. May showed, uh, get, characterized majority rule in the case of uh, two candidates. This isn't actually the most interesting case because uh, most of the voting rules that I was talking about uh, in the introduction, uh, Borda, plurality rule, uh, runoff voting, uh, all coincide with majority rule in the case of two candidates. Uh, but uh, we, we see that if we extend May by adding a requirement of uh, IIA, then the same characterization that May proposed for two candidates works for any number of candidates. I have, um, oh, in, in, in my next lecture, which will be coming up uh, in 20 minutes or so, we'll, we'll see a different generalization of May. Uh, I have one more result, but I think rather than uh, looking at that result, this might be a good place to, to stop. But there haven't, there haven't been all that many questions during the lecture, so I'm hoping that there might be some now that I've, uh, that I've finished the lecture. Uh, Elkhanan? Uh, yes. Yeah, I suggest, yes, there were some questions which uh, I thought was best to defer to the end of the lecture. I suggest that what we'll do now is unmute uh, the participants and uh, anyone who's in interested, please uh, raise your hand and Eric, I will let you simply, uh, uh, do you see the, I see that there's a, uh, a question by uh, Andreas. Andreas, do you want to go, please? Uh, yeah, this was in one of the earlier slides. It was again a question about genericity. Um, it was that um, D and one of the other axioms implies non-original generically, and I was not um, not sure at that point, but. Oh, okay. So, so, so you're you're just worried about the the generic part. Of it. Yeah, I would I would just not write it's, this. It's, it's a very technical point. I think it's not yeah not it, an important it, question. It, so, so right. The 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 point is that uh, even if a voting rule is uh, ordinal most of the time, there there might be one particular profile for which we use additional information to determine the winner. But uh, uh, that's not going to, with, with, with probability one, that 
particular profile is not going to make any difference. Uh, okay, so then one could rephrase this theorem as if S satisfies S, P, and D, then F is almost surely oh, yes, it, it, ordinal. Right. I was thinking that the that generic is, name is a, is a synonym for almost surely. Yeah, with the generically, I thought like there was a certain concept of measure or distance on the space of voting rules, but this seems to be not the case. No. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sir, do you want to? I think you had a question that was left unanswered. Are yes. You, uh, again, yes, it's not. Uh, it's not on the main main thing, but uh, approval voting uh, is not well defined. Uh, which means, for example, and, and for, for example, it doesn't satisfy AIA. It does if you add a fixed uh, U0 level. But for example, I can decide that I vo approve the, the top half of my candidates. I think that will not satisfy AIA. Am I right? So yeah, what oh. I'm saying, approval voting needs That's also fine. behavior. The approval voting needs a mechanism to translate preference right. into the vote. Right. And there may no, be you... many mechanisms like this, and some of them will satisfy AA, some of them will not. So, it's, so in fact, it's a huge class of, of uh, outcomes right. that you get by approval voting. That's right. So, so, so you were def I, I was defining approval voting as follows. I internally have a, uh, a level uh, a yeah. standard that I apply. and if, if a candidate is above the standard, then then I approve him, and if he's below the standard, I don't approve him. Uh, that that version is cardinal, yeah. but it does satisfy IIA. If, yeah. if if my if my criterion is that I always approve the top half, you're right. That does not. Uh, that does not violate. That 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 does not satisfy IIA. But that and as it's also not it's also not cardinal. But but I. Well, none of them are cardinal. Uh, they are. They, you need cardinal plus, cardinal plus something, or minus something, or you know, or ordinal, or in fact, it's ordinal plus something. It's somewhere in no. the middle. Right. Okay, uh, Moshe Habib, you wanted to ask a question. No. Okay. Uh, no. Abraham Neyman, you would like to ask a question? No. No? Okay. Crystal clear. clear. Ah, just a moment. I Crystal clear. Maybe Fine. I, may, maybe I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. No, you're okay. not. No, you're not. <laughs> no. Okay. Oliver, uh, I think you had a question during the talk about single peaked. Would you like to ask it? Oliver, are you with us? You should unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Oliver is there. And there was Raul. Raul, are you with us? Elkhanan, Oliver says he's not allowed to unmute himself. He writes it. Himself. Not allowed to unmute himself? How come? Just a second. I'll try unmute him. I'm not... Uh, there, thank you. Oh, here you are. Yes, please ask your okay. question. Um, sure, this is a quick one. Um, you were talking about um, natural conditions that um, rule out condensate cycles um, and had the comment about how uh, preferences could be single peaked. Um, are there important features of the ideological distribution um, that are required for single peaking to happen? Like, you know, do you need to have one peak in the uh, density of, of people's ideology or something like that? The, the only, for ideological preferences to be single peaked, all that's necessary is that uh, you evaluate candidates by how close they are to you in ideological space. There, there, there could be multiple candidates who are equidistant, so you, you, you could be indifferent between them, but uh, uh, nothing more than uh, ideological 
distance is uh, is used to to evaluate uh, these candidates. Great. So, like, it wouldn't matter if we had a really huge spike of moderate voters and a really huge spike of super conservative voters. Uh, that's um, right. Well, we, we don't need that. any. There are no requirements on the distribution of voters at all, or on the distribution of candidates. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are running out of one question. Uh, uh, we are running out of time. Alex, what? Alex Gershkov, did you have a question? Well, then, Sergio, go uh, ahead. And uh, yeah. I, uh, just, I have a question on also. If, if you have, if you have, your restriction was on script U, which is a common restriction for everyone. Everyone right. has to choose its utility out of a certain given set. Now, right. you could imagine. Uh, talking about restrictions on profiles. You could, yes. Which, are, which is not necessarily a product restriction, which is what you have now. That's right. Uh, That's right. Are there any results where you can say, well, if there is strategy proofness on uh, on uh, sets of profiles or something like on on profile sets, then that's a maximal or anything anything in this vein, which is not a product restriction. There, there are such results, but they but they are. Um... Not as elegant. <laughs> they're they're much weaker. So let's put it that way. You, sure. the, yeah. you 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 can say a little bit, but not very much for uh, for such right. cases. Nothing really interesting there at the moment. Not not nothing nothing terribly interesting exactly. Okay. Is there time for another clarifying question? Sure. Yes. So. Uh, you mentioned that uh, ideological distance is uh, could replace the issue of single picked. So let me just make sure that I understand. Assume that uh, each individual has some standing on two coordinates of some, uh, so represented in the in the in the plan with two coordinates, one for each issue. Uh, and, no, no, that's not going to. It, it has to be one dimensional. One dimension, okay, okay. If it's one dimension, because you say distance, so I was thinking it's also in two dimensional no, I, and I was confused. Okay. Okay. 